So this lecture is an introduction to Unix and Unix-like operating systems. Uh, in this class, we're going to be discussing high-performance computing, parallel programming. Um, most large clusters uh, that are designed, uh, large clusters of computers that are designed to operate as massively parallel uh, infrastructure to run co um, computational programs on are some flavor of Unix, most likely Linux, but, but uh, possibly um, some other form of Unix. So to talk about Unix we're going to start at the beginning uh, before Unix. So uh, before there was a Unix operating system there were certainly computers. Um, those computers had operating systems that were written in assembler and Assembler is a, essentially a human unreadable programming language. It's not easy for a human to understand uh, you know, this language and read it easily. And so this uh, language is written specific to the architecture uh, of the hardware. So in other words, if you had a program that was written to run on a Motorola processor, you could not then take that to uh, a Hewlett Packard processor. So therefore, any kind of program written and assembler is not portable from one architecture to the other. So in 1969, a couple of guys at AT&T, uh, namely Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, wrote what they called the Unix operating system. Uh, it wasn't originally written in C, but in the early 70s, just a few years after its initial inception, uh, it was completely rewritten in C. And C was a language actually invented by Ritchie himself, and the benefit of C is that C, C programs through a compiler or C programs use a compiler to then translate uh, the C into assembler on any specific hardware and therefore they are portable uh, and that was its strength. So because Unix was written in C and C was portable uh, from hardware to hardware, uh, portability was the strength of the Unix operating system. At the time, there was a law that uh, I think has been revoked since then, but it prevented AT&T from selling its software uh, to make a profit. It could only charge a small um, sort of nom nominal fee and, and had to distribute uh, Unix openly, meaning uh, the actual source code of the operating system itself. And so uh, it was mostly just distributed to academia, a few universities, and one of the first universities to really pick up uh, and begin to develop their own version of Unix was uh, the University of California at Berkeley. And uh, its version of Unix is called BSD Unix. And one of the kind of uh, significant uh, contributions that BSD Unix added to, uh, added to Unix that we still use today and we'll talk about later in this class is, is, a, is a particular editor, a way of editing text files called Vi. Um, also, you know, modern versions of Mac OS are essentially um, cousins or, or variants of the original BSD Unix. Um, and so they picked up where AT&T left off. And over some time, uh, many other companies uh, took AT&T's code, uh, Unix, and then again developed their own flavors. And so uh, Sun, which uh, of course now is Oracle, uh, had its own version they called Solaris, and that, that version is today still, uh, still distributed. Uh, IBM had a version that they called AIX. Uh, HP had a version, HPUX. And of course Apple um, developed wh what they initially called Mac OS X, uh, or Mac OS 10, but now they've simply just uh, shortened the name to Mac OS, and underneath um, the, the sort of uh, beautiful graphical user interface on a Mac is, of course, uh, a Unix kernel. And so uh, th this fragmentation, though, led to some problems because what it did was uh, it, it broke some of the portability, which was initially. Uh, the greatest feature of, of Unix. So uh, after some time Novell uh, bought AT&T's sort of development group for Unix uh, and what they did was release the Unix trademark to um, 
to to an open standards body that eventually became to known as the open group uh, and this this body still exists it's a it's a consortium of many of the companies that we just talked about that have their own version of Unix, uh, Oracle, Sun, uh, Sun, which became Oracle, and, and Mac, and others, contribute to this group. And what they try to do is uh, to standardize the Unix um, distribution so that it so that it will remain portable. Um, part of what they do, do um, again, uh, is develop a single Unix specification. This is a joint effort between the Open Group and what was initially um, IEEE, which is a professional organization for uh, electronics and, and electrical engineers, IEEE developed what they called the Portable Operating System Interface for Computing Environments. Uh, the, the short name or the acronym is called POSIX. Uh, and so later, uh, this joint effort between IEEE and the Open Group resulted in this single Unix specification, which is a just a, a, a written down set of standards as to what a Unix operating system should do, uh, should be. And the current version is version 4, and if you'd like to take a look, at, there's a hyperlink here. And so if we fast forward to the 90s, um, Linux was writ first written uh, by a guy named Linus Torvalds. And it was distributed under the GNU public, general public license. So uh, we'll talk just a second about what GNU is. But um, a general public license is a very restrictive open source license, meaning very restrictive in the sense of uh, very restricted to be open. Uh, any any um, software that's distributed under this license, any software that's derived from it must also be distributed with its source code. And so it's it's... It's a very open license. Uh, it's very difficult to take anything uh, that's distributed under the general public license and eventually commercialize it. And this is one reason that Linux has remained free for the most part um, for all these years. And so it was originally written by Linus Torvalds. Uh, of course, Linux itself is just really just specifically the kernel of the operating system, and we'll talk in just a second loosely or at a high level what the kernel is um, but any operating system also needs applications to be useful and so GNU is part of the uh, free software uh, foundation which is run by this guy uh, Richard Stallman uh, GNU is a recursive acronym it's kind of silly but it just stands for GNU is not Unix um, so uh, the, the this uh, GNU supplies many of the application tools for Linux, and so really, what we when we say Linux, we're almost always saying mean, referring to GNU slash Linux, the combination of the applications and the kernel that makes it useful. And a lot of times, you'll hear even me say uh, uh, just loosely in, in speech when I talk about Linux or Unix uh, or GNU Linux. Um, I, I'm using them interchangeably in speech, and almost always I'm referring to specifically GNU Linux, uh, but sometimes, again, you'll just hear me say Linux or even Unix. Uh, and while I don't, uh, you know, I use them interchangeably, but understand that, that there are subtle differences between all of them. Uh, sometimes you'll see this sort of collection um, of Unix-like operating systems written that with an like asterisk INX, and that's because in Unix, as we'll learn later, there uh, are certain things called regular expressions of which a asterisk is one, and, and the asterisk happens to be a wild card, which means uh, it can sort of take on any value. And so uh, that, that's sometimes you'll see this, you know, asterisk Nix to refer to all of these Unix-like operating systems. So there are many versions of um, or distributions of Linux now. Uh, a distribution of Linux is just when uh, usually a community of people get together and decide on a set of applications and, and features, usability features, that are most beneficial to the community that they're targeting. So for example, Ubuntu is, is a very popular Linux distribution, possibly the most popular. And it's meant to be very user-friendly and come with a fairly complete set of applications. 
for a, a sort of day-to-day -day user of the computer. Um, there are other um, more targeted distributions that uh, are intended to, say, focus on high-performance high computing environments, other things like that. Um, so uh, Ubuntu is actually built on top of Debian. So Debian has a, has a smaller set of applications than what Ubuntu would ship with. Uh, Fedora is what's left over uh, from the Red Hat distribution uh, when Red Hat went commercial. So uh, Red Hat uh, produces a, a, a variant uh, or a distribution of Linux. Of course, the kernel itself is still shipped under the GNU public license and must remain free and open. Um, but the distribution, uh, the set of applications, and the support for those applications is then uh, distributed commercially by Red Hat. So in other words, when you buy a Red Hat um, a Linux operating system, you're getting support for the set of applications uh, that is shipped with it. Support meaning, you know, user help and other things. Uh, they're, 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 you know, these are just a couple of popular distributions. There are so many, there are, you know, quite possibly 50 or 100 uh, widely used distributions of Linux, and, and it's quite easy to actually build your own. So just briefly about the Unix architecture. Um, this is not a class in computer science. We're not going to go into great depth about this stuff. Uh, and quite frankly, to use it, you, you, just, you don't need to know that much. But basically, there's a division of labor in the Unix environment between the kernel and the shell. So the, the kernel... Uh, is the sort of lowest level part of the soft operating system. Um, and the shell provides the applications and the user interface to those applications. So often we, we talk about the shell uh, and possibly the way the reason it's called a shell is because it wraps around the kernel. So the kernel talks to the hardware uh, and, and it basically serves as a go-between between the hardware and the shell and the shell of course interacts with users. So uh, one in, important feature is that there's only one kernel on a on a on a on an operating system, but there be mo but there will be multiple shells always associated with multiple users. Um, so there can, uh, as we'll see on the next slide, one of the features of a Unix operating system is that it's a multi-user environment, and so every user can have its own shell running simultaneously, interacting with a single kernel. And then, of course, then the shell also implements or interfaces with all these applications. So things like CP, that's just a copy of file, grep, tar, these are all small, simple applications, and we'll learn about some of them in the class um, that, uh, that the user would interface with. So uh, again, uh, that's just a little bit about the kernel-shell relationship. And some common or the most important features of Unix, as I said, it's a, a multi-user system, so, so many users can be logged in at once and run programs that compete. Um, and, and all of them interact with a single uh, kernel. Uh, multitasking, so any user can also run multiple tasks simultaneously. Of course, this is pretty common in all computing environments these days also provides a repository of applications. So every, uh, even the most basic uh, Linux or GNU Linux distributions will have uh, a small set of applications shipped with them that, uh, and, and other ones can uh, be installed, but, but these are always the sort of a simple operating tasks will always be there, like copying files and del you know, adding and removing files and editing files and these kind of things. Uh, the philosophy of Unix is to use a building block approach. In other words, to take a, a, a series of very small applications that typically only do one thing and then pipe them together, or in other words, like a string them together to perform more complicated tasks. And another thing that all Unix features uh, machines will have is a sophisticated pattern matching. So this is typically through something called regular expressions. And we'll uh, have a dedicated lecture on that later. But um, if you learn to do some simple pattern matching, you can uh, you can do these quite sophisticated things. So uh, I'll, I'll show you an example here here shortly. Um, Unix is also intended to be a, a programming language. So 
uh, this is not the kernel itself or the operating system itself, but rather through the shell. So all implementations of shells, and there are several, all implementations of shells will uh, have some basic uh, sort of features of a programming language, like flow control, you know, if statements, uh, for loops, variables, these kinds of things. Uh, they are not the um, the easiest programming languages to learn or use, but uh, to to have some basic shell scripting uh, ability in your toolbox uh, can really make you make it useful. Of course, a lot of uh, we're going to use Python extensively in this class, and a lot of the typical shell scripting uh, uh, sort of batch tasks that you might do, for example, to rename a bunch of files or to move a bunch of files that match some specific pattern from one place to another. Um, many of them can be achieved also through Python quite easily, and so we'll talk talk a little bit about that. So in this class, of course, we're going to use the Cloud9 uh, sort of cloud-based computing environment. And what that is is actually a Linux virtual machine uh, running in the cloud that, that we're interfacing with through a web browser. So in Cloud9, if you were to want to open up uh, a new terminal, you'd do it this way, and the terminal is the sort of text interface to the shell, uh, and this is how we would uh, interact with with uh, the Unix. So this is actually a Linux machine, and we can see that uh, by running the command uname a, and this gives us some information not only about uh, the the fact that uh, this is Linux, um, it, the kernel version is here 4.974. Uh, and there's some information, of course, about the time. Uh, it also shows us that this that we're running on a uh, basically an Intel 64-bit machine, and this is a variant of uh, GNU Linux, of course. So uh, just to give you an example, a short example, we'll learn more about these uh, uh, specific commands later in the class, but um, you know I'm going to just create a few files uh, using the touch command, so I'll just call it file1.c file. 2.c file3.c and then I'll uh, uh, create some files that have uh, other file extensions so let's say file1.cxx file2.cxx file3. Dot... so these would these would be meant to uh, represent a, a set of C and C++ files in uh, in the directory. So I can list the directory and show the files that are there. Um, and then I can use some pattern matching. So if I only wanted to list the C files in the directory, I could use that asterisk as we mentioned and then just put the .c file extension there. And it's only going to list the C files. Um, likewise, I could only list the CXX files. Um, I could also do something like uh, create a an archive of only the CXX files and so the way I would do that is use a tar command we'll we'll learn more about these commands later in the class but tar is essentially you can think of it like a zip file it's a it's a way to collect uh, a tape archive um, of a specific set of files so I could uh, r run this I'm going to create it um, uh, few options we'll learn more about this later uh, but then I can say files.tar.bz2 uh, and then use the regular expression uh, to select only the CXX files and so then you see now if I list the directory there's something called files.tar.bz2 and if we were to you know sort of open this uh, then we'd find that the three files inside are the three CXX files, and they were selected through this uh, regular expression. So again, we're going to learn more about the specific um, commands we ran here, but this is just to give you a flavor of how you'd interact with the Unix operating system.